Don't let anybody make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you are too arrogant. And if you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. Hotep, which in the language of ancient Egypt means we come with justice in peace. Welcome to Freedom Now, the Saturday Pan-Africanist and International World Affairs program. Freedom Now is committed to the principle of the rights of all peoples and nations to self-determination. We thank you deeply for your contribution to KPFK, which permits programs like Freedom Now to stay on the air. In this era of corporate acquisition and co-optation of all dissident media, we provide the microphone, challenging their corporate and racist point of view. So stay tuned for agenda here at Freedom Now. Fellas, I'm ready to get up and do my thing. I want to get into it, man, you know. Freedom Now. Freedom Now! Freedom Now. At KPFK. Peace, hoteps, and wisdom to all of our faithful and devoted listeners out there in the radio verse. This is Brother Brandon Sankara, and I want to start things off with a thank you to all of you loyal listeners out there who continue to support Freedom Now through this latest season of Fun Drive. You keep us on our mission and allow us to bring you our agenda for today, Saturday, August 27th, 2022. We begin with our dear sister Luyanda Kavoka, riding the waves of history, giving us the historical drumbeat calendar for the week, reminding us that every day is a day in African history. After that, Dr. Gerald Horn will be in conversation with Professor Tess Chukalakal, Associate Professor of Africana Studies and English at Bowdoin College in Maine. And for our purposes today, the co-author of the book, Jim Crow Literature and the Legacy of Sudden E. Griggs. These two will be diving into the life of the book's namesake, Sudden E. Griggs, an important figure in late 1800s literature and politics as Africans in America began imagining their future in this place called the United States. Now, if only we could send a message back to them. Then, in the second half of our program, we'll be hearing from Professor John Matthews, professor of English at Boston University and author of the book, Hidden in Plain Sight, Slave Capitalism in Poe, Hawthorne, and Joel Chandler Harris. Keeping the program's minds on the 1800s lives of Africans in America, Professor Matthews will be exploring the historical context surrounding his book and providing us with some enlightening anecdotes to shed light on the crime against humanity on which the U.S. stands to this very day. Stay tuned to hear more. Now, while we are in Fun Drive and still able to bring you this much content, we want to remind you to call 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735. Or go online to kpfk.org and pledge your support to the station at any level. Remember, these are all tax-deductible donations. You can become a member for just $25 and help keep Freedom Now on the air to bring you this type of quality programming. 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735. Pledge $25, $50, maybe even $100 to support our efforts here at Freedom Now. 
Now I'm going to be on the ones and twos as we pour this knowledge, making sure your mental cup runneth over with revolutionary wisdom right here to quench your mental thirst on freedom now. KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles and KPFK.org on the web. Now, to make sure we stay on a smooth ride with that cultural vibe you know and love, we'll be enjoying a musical bottom featuring Jay Dilla, Freddie Hubbard, Clifford Brown, Abdullah Ibrahim, and Art Farmer. Now, people get ready for this train of coming, taking you one step closer to mental liberation, and stay tuned for the beat of that historical drum and a conversation with Dr. Gerald Horn and Professor Tess Chukalakal. Barigani. This is Sister Luyanda with the African Drum Beat Historical Calendar with Sala! Yoyo! And Ati. The purpose of this presentation is to put into context our present struggle against the war against racism, police brutality, sexism, economic exploitation, within a broad chronological perspective as to gain strength by standing on the shoulders of our revolutionary ancestors. September 1st, 1961. The armed struggle for the liberation of Eritrea from the Ethiopian Empire begins. Ethiopia, an ancient empire, is composed of many kingdoms brought into the empire under the ancient leaders of Ethiopia. Eritrea revolted against the force of integration into Ethiopia. September 1st, 1892. Queen Kozia, an African woman Shiro, leads one of the many labor revolts in the present-day U.S. colony of St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. September 2, 1945. Under the leadership of Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam becomes independent after a long war against Japanese and French imperialism. September 2, 1917. Queen Lili Ukulani was the last of the royal Hawaiian monarch of a free Hawaii before U.S. colonization. She resisted the U.S. takeover, and on January 16, 1893, she was arrested and imprisoned by the U.S. Marines during the U.S. invasion to seize Hawaii. September 4, 1841. Preemption Act makes Western United States Native American land open to racist European settler colonialism without any regards or concern for their traditional 500,000 year presence, thus declaring Native Americans non-human. September 4, 1973. Salvador Allende, democratically elected Prime Minister of Chile, was overthrown by the CIA-backed military coup and was murdered by the U.S. henchman General Pinochet. American copper corporations dictated to the United States government that Prime Minister Allende must be murdered because he demanded better working conditions for the copper workers of Chile. Mm -hmm. September 4, 1895. Ching Yu Huang was born. Ching, a Chinese socialist and women's rights advocate, who emerged from the May 4th movement of 1915 to become the teacher and leader of the anti-foot binding campaign, where baby girls' feet were broken and wrapped to produce small feet, a symbol of beauty, under feudal China. She was a leading member of the Chinese Communist Party in 1921, which defeated the Japanese, United States and British combined efforts to colonize China. September 4, 1781. In California, El Pueblo de Nuestra Senora Reina de Los Angeles, later shortened to Los Angeles, was founded. September 4, 1957. Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus calls out the National Guard to bar African students from attending Little Rock High School 
which was tax supported by African residents of Arkansas. This has been the historical calendar on Freedom Now, KPFK 90.7 in Los Angeles, 98.7 in Santa Barbara, and streaming worldwide at www.kpfk.org. We would like to close out with a collective chant of solidarity with all of those in the listening audience who side with the oppressed, with the masses of humanity, with the environment, with the political spiritual message of Jesus, Allah, Jah, Buddha, or whatever we choose to call, and in the struggle of people over prophets. We chant Amandla, and our response is Awetu, which means the power is ours. Amandla, Awetu, Amandla, Awetu, Amandla, Awetu. The historical calendar is such a great tradition and reminder of the importance of freedom now here on KPFK, and we need your support to keep that tradition alive. Call 818-985-KPFK, that's 818-985-5735, or go online to kpfk.org to donate and pledge your support, and you can begin to bring home some great wisdom for your bookshelf. That's right. Call 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735 or go online to kpfk.org to donate right now. I now send you over to Dr. Gerald Horn, who's being joined by Professor Tess Chukalakal. Take it away, Dr. Horn. This is Gerald Horn for KPFK, kpfk.org. And with me on the line is Professor Tess Chakalakal, Associate Professor of Africana Studies and English at Bowdoin College in Maine and co-editor of the book, Jim Crow Literature and the Legacy of Sutton E. Griggs. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles, Professor Chakalakal. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us. So. Who was Sutton E. Griggs? Why did you decide to publish a book about him? And describe for us his premier work, Imperium in Imperium. Sure, I'd be happy to. Sutton E. Griggs was in many respects the first political African-American novelist. And this is a claim made by the scholar Wilson J. Moses um, a couple of decades ago. And my interest in Sutton E. Griggs really started with uh, my reading of his premier novel, Imperium and Imperio, of which I've just co-edited with my co-editor, Kenneth Warren, a new critical edition forthcoming coming from West Virginia University Press in the fall, uh, in which we provide a kind of um, scholarly uh, apparatus to help current readers understand, answer the question that you've just raised, which is who was Sutton E. Griggs? Sutton E. Griggs was a black novelist who hailed from Texas. He was born in Chatham, Texas, and he um, was a, a Baptist minister by training. He went to the Richmond Theological Seminary, but due to a number of different circumstances, chief of which was his editing of a religious newspaper called the Virginia Baptist Newspaper when he moved to Virginia after receiving his Doctor of Divinity degree. Uh, he became kind of embroiled in black politics of the 1890s. And it was during that period that you saw a lot of division among African Americans, particularly in the South, about how to imagine a future in which they could thrive and be free following the abolition of slavery. He ran into a number of different difficulties, uh, falling into debt, getting into a series of arguments with um, an editor uh, known now as the fighting editor, a guy by the name of John Mitchell Jr., who edited the Richmond Planet in Virginia and was a very powerful newspaper editor. So Griggs was just a guy who was involved in black print culture 
in the post-bellum period and decided that the best way to reach an audience was through fiction. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm interested in the way African Americans deployed fiction in order to sway public opinion. And in my view, Sutton E. Griggs was a kind of master at this. He, um, he founded his own press, though his first novel he actually um, published with the Vanity Press in Ohio, um, but called the Editor Publishing Company. But after that, he published four more novels um, in the imprimatur of his own press um, called the Orion Press. And he really just created these fantastical, but that's at the same time, realistic stories that helped explain and um, allow his readers to understand the, the politics of his late 19th century moment. Mm -hmm. Now, he complained about the publishing industry and his audience, so he started his own company. But another problem that he may have encountered was the idea that I believe it's you contribute on page 151, mm -hmm. the idea from Booker T. Washington, mm -hmm. the premier black leader of the first decade or so of the 20th century, who dismissed fiction. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how widespread was that idea of Booker T. Washington's? Right. I mean, Booker T. Washington would say that he didn't have time for fiction, right? He preferred real stories about real men. Nonetheless, Booker T. Washington was actually a great reader of fiction. He read quite a lot of fiction. He was a very close and personal friend of both the premier black novelist of the period, Charles Chestnut and Paul Lawrence Dunbar. So people were reading fiction in the period, though it was primarily a kind of leisure activity, which I say in my essay in that collection, that it took a lot of time to read a work of fiction, and it wasn't time that most working class, black or white Americans had. And so what, what Griggs wanted to do was sort of to develop or instill what I call the habit of reading in African Americans of the period to sit still and be quiet and sort of engage or become absorbed in a novel. And this was sort of marked his turn to fiction writing that he believed it was a kind of method in which to create, and, and this was not an uncommon belief in the period, a way of making citizens to really consider different points of views and perspectives in order to come up with the perspective of one's own. So it's true it's a little uh, lofty, um, but it wasn't an uncommon viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Now, your colleague and fellow contributor to this volume, John Grusser, mm -hmm. has a new biography that just emerged from Oxford University Press about Sutton E. Griggs. Are there any revelations in that new book that you would be able to share with the audience? Well, the, the big revelation in my mind that uh, John Grusser has come up with is just the, the scope of Griggs's influence in the period. I mean, here's um, a novelist who wrote five novels, but very few Americans um, have heard of Griggs today. And what Grusser really re reveals in his biography is how much Griggs actually was known, particularly in the South, among Black Americans during his lifetime. He was an avid collector of books. He had his own library, which he shared with his congregation. Uh, he was a man really of all trades. John calls Greg's man on the firing line. And he really was very much out in the forefront. And though we don't hear of him the way we hear of say, W.E.B. Du Bois or Booker T. Washington, what Grusser really shows in his biography is he is a man that should be known because of his ideas and because of his influence in the period. Now, your book, juxtaposes Sutton E. Griggs' premier novel, speaking of Imperium and Imperio, mm -hmm. with the novel by Thomas Dixon, The Klansman, the source for the defaming Hollywood cinematic blockbuster, Birth of a Nation, 
What do you see as the parallels between those two? Well, you know, Thomas Dixon wrote a trilogy, and uh, the the Klansman is really the most famous of the trilogy. And Greg's it wasn't really Imperium and Imperia, which was first published in 1899. It was actually the Kindred Hand, of which there's a new edition that John and our colleague Hannah Wallinger has just brought out, also from West Virginia University Press. And it was that novel that Griggs wrote in direct response to Thomas Dixon's novels, to the trilogy, as a kind of way of combating the influence of uh, Dixon's ideas that he presented in his novels. So Griggs really thought that that what you know that there was a kind of literary or uh, symbolic war going on in America. And that war was really taking place through literature. How literature was shaping the hearts and minds of its citizens. And so here's, here's um, uh, Dixon, who's writing these novels that are explicitly racist. And of course, if you've seen Birth of the Nation, you can see the kind of widespread um, propaganda that these novels uh, were, were able to produce around relations between blacks and whites and various stereotypes about both groups. So Griggs was really writing, as were a number of African-American novelists of the period, to oppose that those ideas that Dixon was presenting. And again, Grusser in his biography talks at length about the National Baptist Convention um, kind of hiring, paying Griggs to produce fiction in direct opposition to Dixon. So fiction had a great deal of power in the period because it had the ability to influence people, um, whether in the form of reading those novels themselves or how those ideas became part of, of the culture. Hmm. It just occurred to me if there had been any attempt by an independent black organization such as the National Baptist Convention that you just referenced mm -hmm. to try to turn one of Griggs's novels into a cinematic blockbuster. Great idea, yeah. If only, right? There, oh. there you know, uh, of course, um, right now it's escaping me. His name, who, who uh, was a famous film, black filmmaker, Oscar Michaud. Oscar Michaud mm -hmm. did adapt um, Chestnut's novel, The House Behind the Cedars, for the screen. But other than Michaud, there weren't a lot of black filmmakers who were adapting novels in the period. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the radicalism of Sudden Griggs' premier novel is that it posits an independent black empire or independent black state in Texas. And we know that by 1916, in the U.S. Southwest, there was the so-called Plan de San Diego, which purportedly involved a plot by Black Americans in league with revolutionary Mexico, perhaps assisted by Japan, to do precisely that, to establish independent Black and Indigenous republics in the U.S. Southwest. And I'm wondering, uh, where did Suddenly Griggs get his idea for this novel? I mean, is there any conception? We know, of course, that there were, was also talk at that time about an independent black state in Indian territory, speaking of Oklahoma, yeah. and New Mexico, et cetera. But do we have any specificity as to where he got his ideas? Well, I think I think what, what you said is, is exactly right. There were all kinds of plots in the period um, to create these independent, or the, the possibility of an independent, separate black state. A state within the state is how Imperium and Imperium would be translated. In the novel, though, uh, there, there are two characters, Belton and Bernard, and they're good friends, and the story is really about these characters and their opposing ideologies. So Bernard is the one who advocates separatism. He's the radical. And Belton is the one who advocates for integration or a more conservative program. And he's actually, in many respects, the hero of the story, though he's executed by Bernard. So what, what, what Griggs is doing in this novel is to show these competing ideologies of radicalism and 
a kind of conservatism as they go into battle in the manifestation of these two characters. It's really an, a political allegory of some of the political ideas that are circulating at the moment, and he kind of plays it out. And that's what, in my mind, is so fascinating about the novel, is the way in which he, he kind of imagines what would happen if some of these ideas came to bear. And at the same time, he gives these ideas a backstory in the biographies of his two protagonists. Mm -hmm. Now, one of your contributors also draws a parallel that I'm sure has occurred to many in our audience. That is to say, a parallel between Marcus Messiah Garvey and Sutton E. Griggs. Well, what parallels do you see? I don't, I mean, I think that um, Griggs wasn't really a, a race man in Hazel Carby's terms, you know. He wasn't really leading a people. He was really someone who was analyzing and thinking about the ideas of the moment and encouraging people of the period to kind of um, lay claim to all the different ideas that were circulating. So unlike Marcus Garvey, who had a real kind of commitment, a political commitment to a back to Africa movement or however he would he would phrase it, Griggs is really sort of interested in help, not helping, but, but allowing for the circulation of a number of different ideologies, not representing one. Um, and, and that marks a pretty important difference, which is what marks the novelist uh, apart from the, the politician or the political figure, which uh, Marcus Garvey mostly was. Finally, Professor Chakala Call, the co-editor of the book, Jim Crow Literature and the Legacy of Sudden E. Briggs, you mentioned a moment or two ago two of the peers of Sutton E. Griggs, speaking of Charles Chestnut, speaking of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, what parallels and divergences do you see between these three like men who happen to be fiction creators? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, the biggest parallel, the biggest connection between the three is their commitment to literature and to books. That book production was so central to these three black authors, Dunbar, Chestnut, and Griggs. And they had a kind of faith in the power of reading, which I find so admirable. Where they diverge is that Dunbar and Chestnut really, well, Chestnut lived for several years, though he was born in Cleveland. He um, lived in Fayetteville for his youth, but then moved back to Cleveland um, at the age of around 22 after his marriage to Susan. Dunbar spent very little time in the South. He was born in Dayton, Ohio, spent much of his life, his youth in Ohio, and then went on to New York and London. Whereas Griggs was born in Texas. He went on to live in Virginia, in Memphis, Tennessee, and then died in Texas. He actually spent very little, if any time at all, outside of the South. And that kind of commitment to the South, particularly to Texas, which he expresses in a couple of his novels, really sets them apart in my mind from Chestnut and Dunbar. Both Chestnut and Dunbar published their fiction with white Northern um, publications like Lippincott's Monthly Magazine, The Atlantic Monthly, Houghton Mifflin, um, Dodd, Mead and Company. Dunbar and Chestnut were looking for a mainstream audience and really a northern elite audience, trying to break out of this kind of um, narrow scope of the African-American press. Greggs, on the other hand, I think embraced it. He started his own press. He was speaking directly to black southern uh, uh, citizens. And this really marked an important difference between Griggs and probably the most um, well-received or popular Black writers of the period, Dunbar and Chestnut. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Professor Tess Chakalakal, co-editor of the book, Jim Crow Literature and the Legacy of Sutton E. Griggs, an associate professor of Africana Studies and English at Bowdoin College in Maine, Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK, Los Angeles. My pleasure. Thank you.
special thanks to Professor Chuck Lacall for sharing her hard-earned knowledge with us. Where else can you get such quality content, context, and historical perspective other than Freedom Now? Call 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735. Or go online to kpfk.org to donate and support the show by donating today and get one of our awesome premiums to expand your library and your mind. Dr. Horn, tell the people about what they can take home today. Donate $100 and receive a signed copy of Gerald Horn's latest book, Hot Off the Presses, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism. Fascism, which may be around the corner in the United States, is a combination of both slavery and Jim Crow and is presently creeping into North America on little cat feet with Texas in the vanguard. In order to be defeated, it must be understood. In order to be understood, this book must be consulted. Why is it that so many black people in California have roots in Texas, including the first black mayor, Tom Bradley, the first black mayor of San Francisco, Willie Brown, the entertainer and actor and singer, Jamie Foxx. Read this book. If you have roots in Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, where else but on Freedom Now can you not only find out about fascism, to find out about black American fraternities and sororities like the Omegas and the Alphas and the Deltas. Be the first on your block, in your school, in your church, in your fraternity or sorority that has a copy of the counter-revolution of 1836. Understand why it was that it was Texas that led the war against Mexico which led to the United States seizing California in the first place. Why is Texas in the vanguard of cracking down on so-called critical race theory, cracking down on women's reproductive freedom, cracking down on the population of Mexican descent? Why does Texas have the largest black population in the United States? Why is it that the seeds for the overthrow of Roe versus Wade, a step towards enhanced patriarchy and fascism, were planted in Texas. Where else but freedom now can you get serious historical analysis of the LAPD or serious analysis of black fraternities and sororities? Pick up the phone and donate $100 and receive a signed copy of the counter-revolution of 1836, Texas slavery and Jim Crow and the roots of US fascism. Thank you, Dr. Horn and folks, there you have it. Call 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735. Or go online to kpfk.org to donate right now and make your support for the show and the station felt. Now we're going to keep this train of moving and send you back over to Dr. Horn, who's being joined on the line by John Matthews, right here on Freedom Now. The mic is yours, Dr. Horn. This is Gerald Horn for KPFK, kpfk.org. And with me on the line is John Matthews, professor of English at Boston University and author of the book, Hidden in Plain Sight. Slave Capitalism in Poe Hawthorne and Joel Chandler Harris. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles. Thank you very much for inviting me on your program. Okay, so why did you write this book, Hidden in Plain Sight? Well, there were a few streams that led into my interest in this topic. Um, one had to do with my earlier research and writing. I specialize in the works of William Faulkner, the great Mississippi novelist um, of the first part of the mid-20th mid century. 
And um, I became interested in the way in which his uh, fiction addressed the question of the plantation. But in his greatest novel about this question, um, Absalom Absalom, which was published in 1936, though he tells a broad story in pieces of the history of the plantation and the particular fortunes of one planter whose design is emblematic, uh, there is a section of that career that takes place in Haiti. And it seems to involve a insurrection of some sort. Um, it's not a heavily interpreted or noticed part of the novel, or it wasn't for a long time. And in fact, the planter himself, Thomas Sutpen, doesn't seem to attach much importance to it. However, he brings slaves from the Caribbean through New Orleans. He establishes a plantation that seems indebted to what he learned in Haiti as the overseer on a sugar plantation. And so what I got interested in was this um, sort of interplay between the, the importance of this history, not only to the novel, but to the entire foundation in a way of the um, settler colonies in the United States, but also the way in which the novel itself addresses a, a dynamic of overlooking or failing to pay adequate attention to the history, the deeper history of um, hemispheric European settler colonial um, enterprise. And um, so that stimulated a number of other projects. I wrote an essay on Willa Cather's great novel of the Prairie, um, My Antonia. Um, and that too is um, shows a, a, an example of the way in which slave history is overlooked. There's a single chapter that details the appearance and concerts of a pianist whose name is Blind Darnot, who comes to the, to the um, prairie uh, in Nebraska and does his, um, his music making. But it, it turns out that we learn he has a story that carries back to a Virginia plantation. And so Cather too is trying to deal with this problem of the way in which, in effect, the plantation slave economy was the foundation, but one that's um, overlooked or is treated as with a blind eye in um, in the history of the of the uh, in, in American literature and its mm. and its attempt to deal with this to deal with this history. So, what do you mean by slave capitalism? Well, there's a you know there's a more um, common term that comes out of um, black studies of New World plantation. Uh, capitalism and uh, European um, economic design, uh, which is racial capitalism. And um, it's associated with um, scholars like Robins, like C.L. Robinson, and also um, uh, Du Bois, and uh, more recently in the 1940s, um, Eric uh, Williams. And the idea is that um, slave slavery was an engine for um, modern capitalism, that the wealth that was produced in the new world through slavery fueled the uh, industrial revolution and also, you know, European capitalism's development. I chose slave capitalism because I wanted to return to the idea of the actual physical bodies that were used in these laboring conditions, and also to emphasize the fact that race was a derivative in some ways of the capitalist system that was being used in the new world to, to produce wealth. So slave capitalism to me also points to the way in which indigenous populations were enslaved before they were removed and exterminated. And the way in which other white populations came as indentured servants and under conditions of all but, all but slavery. And I think this, this produces a kind of emphasis on the economics um, that parallel the, the question of, um, of racial exploitation. And so your book deals with some of the titans of U.S. literature, Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Bill Chandler Harris, and how this question of slave capitalism has been threaded through their work. But also on page eight, you referenced the work by Herman Melville, Benito Sereno, which has received considerable attention from historians. Tell our audience about this work 
and why it might be of such interest to historians? It's, it's really um, a work that epitomizes the sort of dynamic that um, I'm interested in because this was a work that was based on an historical event. Um, it's set um, by Melville in 1799. So um, <clears throat> there have been lots of historical explorations of the connection of, of the story to uh, the Haitian Revolution because this is a story about a um, New England sea captain whose name is Amasa Delano and um, who encounters a ship that's uh, struggling at sea. He um, investigates and he learns that um, the captain of the ship, Benita Serino, has, um, has been in um, difficulty in trying to uh, navigate, but also to, it seems, to uh, discipline his crew of, um, of Blacks and also the, the, the um, <clears throat> cargo that he's carrying, which is a slave cargo. And it, what it turns out, what turns out to be the case is that Delano is given every opportunity to see that a slave rebellion has taken place. The name of the ship is the San Dominic. And so set in 1799, this is right in the middle of the Haitian Revolution. Um, and so the connections have to do um, pretty explicitly uh, with looking at some kind of fable or allegory of this um, insurrection, which by the way, um, the entire Atlantic uh, slave owning world was full of dread about, you know, the long history of multiple revolutions and insurrections and bloody violence of my slaves trying to overthrow the system. But culminating in some ways in Haiti, which by 1804 produces the first black republic in the new world. So um, the story is seen as an allegory of this. What interests me is the way in which the sea captain um, uh, is um, so witless, in effect, about what he's seeing. And it seems um, evident that what um, Melville is interested in is this process of active ignorance or deliberate, willful innocence in a certain way, in which those who have interests in the slave trade, who have interests in the system as it exists, refuse to see what is in front of them. So um, it's only very late in the novella that um, the story is divulged and Delano can't avoid his, um, his recognition. But there's a kind of interplay between acknowledging what's taken place and disavowing. And I think this becomes a kind of epitome uh, for Melville. I always think in connection with this of something that, that Baldwin said in The Fire Next Time. Um, he says, it is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence that constitutes the crime. And I think that word constitutes is important because it's not only that the innocence is the crime, but a certain kind of in innocence was responsible for constituting the crime of slavery and of the uh, various forms of economic um, uh, devastation that went along with it. And as a follow-up to that idea, you mentioned on page 25 about what you refer to as, quote, the obliviousness to Haiti, unquote, in the United States. So referring, I take it, to not necessarily what was reflected in Melville's novella, but of course, what is reflected in Melville's mm -hmm. novella, but also subsequently. Uh, could you expand upon that? What do you mean by obliviousness to Haiti? And why do you think it has existed? Um, the, um, you know, the question of obliviousness, I think, has something to do with um, an idea that I wanted to emphasize in the book, and that is that um, the refusal or the denial of um, uncomfortable history of um, the sort of history of uh, slavery and indigenous um, removal that um, that constitutes a kind of original sin. But th this is more than just negative. It's more than just negative denial. There's a kind of production of innocence or production of ignorance, which serves as a kind of counter epistemology, like a different way of viewing the world. So you create a reality, which in fact allows you to disavow 
<clears throat> these um, in this kinds of these kinds of indebtedness. And so, you know, in addition to the work that comes after Benito Serena, which was published in 1855, um, you know, I talk about um, uh, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, which was written by Poe in the 1830s. It, it too is a is a is a narrative that um, displays on many pages the inability of those who are participating in wide settler colonial exploration and um, commercial enterprise, um, fishing enterprise, whaling, and and so forth, to uh, recognize the um, the kinds of violence and the kinds of resistance that they're meeting in the world. So it's a kind of it's on Poe's part, it's a study in this, um, in, a, in a form of equivocation or indecisiveness that um, his that his work um, displays without ever without sort of resolving. So in the case of Haiti, just to answer a little bit more specifically, there's a there's an episode in uh, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym in which. Our protagonist, Pym, finds his way with other crew members to an island called Salal. And Salal is uh, populated only by Black people um, who seem to have a mysterious abhorrence of whiteness in all forms. <laughs> what event? <laughs> what, not so mysterious. <laughs> in fact, on the way in, um, the crew, um, Pym's crew, notices a rock that sort of is standing out and they describe it as a white rock that resembles a bale of cotton. So like these details tell you that you're on the way to a, a, some, kind of a, um, some kind of a setting which is associated with a multiple history, a layered history of new world uh, plantation economy. Salal, I think, um, uh, becomes a, a, um, a kind of um, version of um, of Haiti, this was um, you know published about 20 years after Haiti had established its independence. It was published one year after the Nat Turner Rebellion in Southampton, Virginia, and the book is full of these moments of kind of dreamlike, hallucinatory terror at um, violent threat of endangerment to bodies of a kind of blood bloodiness. And throughout it all, there's a kind of denial of, um, of what Pym is seeing in front of his eyes, the, the sort of murderousness that, um, that actually jeopardizes the whole new world. Now, you mentioned a moment or two ago that you're also a specialist on the work of the novelist William Faulkner with Roots in Mississippi. And I recommend to our audience the film Intruder in the Dust, which is based upon one of his works starring the now neglected uh, black Latino actor, Juan Hernandez. However, Faulkner, perhaps not surprising given his roots in Jim Crow, Mississippi, has been criticized by Du Bois and others for his weaknesses in dealing with contemporary Jim Crow in Mississippi in the 1950s. I mean, what's your assessment uh, of Faulkner um, given his ability, as reflected in Intruder in the Dust, perhaps Absalom Absalom, to write about racism, but perhaps not necessarily uh, being a moral leader or champion in his native Oxford, Mississippi? It's a difficult question, and it's one that remains, in, in, in fact, becomes increasingly vexed as we try to teach Faulkner, as we try to think about Faulkner's achievement in the present moment. Um, I'd go back first to his earlier novels, that, one of which you mentioned, Absalom, and that I've talked about. But um, in the novels Between the Sound and the Fury, which appeared in um, 1929, and Absalom, Absalom in 1936, Faulkner seemed to be taking on all of the root problems of various classes in his, uh, in his South as it modernized. And The Sound and the Fury is, among other things, is a study of the decline of a once prominent family. It's, it's the way in which basically white possessiveness mistakes its fall as somehow illegitimate and a tragedy and produces melancholy. So um, from there, Faulkner writes As I Lay Dying, which is about 
a family of poor whites, hill farmers, who also suffer a catastrophic loss in the death of their mother, and who also are being displaced from their land. And once again, Faulkner shows the way in which these poor whites mistake dispossession in the South as white dispossession. So I think um, in, in the next novel, I'm not going to survey you know, many more, but in 1932, maybe his most important book about race, and it's the one that I always teach in connection with um, this period, is um, Light in August. And Light in August is a vast study of the interrelatedness between racial identity, changing sexual and gender identity, and um, the mobility of class that's happened as a result of um, the Depression and um, the South's belated modernization in the 19, late 1920s and 30s. And this is a, it's a very deep study of the complicated dynamic between um, white identity and black identity, between it, what, it, what it does is to explore the fiction of black and white blood. It examines the um, catastrophic um, uh, consequences of a world that's been divided into strict binaries. And it basically surveys the devastation that Jim Crow segregation has brought to the South. It's, it's a book about the modern um, misery that the South has launched through its long history of commitment to, to racial subjugation. I think by the time um, Faulkner published his Intruder in the Dust in 1948 and the movies made in 1949, uh, he wanted to contribute, he wanted to intervene in the, um, in the process of desegregation. Du Bois once challenged him to a debate Faulkner responded by saying, you and I have almost nothing that we would disagree with, but I politely decline your invitation. And, you know, I think that um, uh, that's not to say that he was um, not deeply complicit in his um, inability to speak more openly and more uh, uh, definitively. Uh, he never opposed, uh, he never opposed desegregation, um, but he was not uh, active in um, in racial, um, you know, in matters of combating racism, and you know, as you pointed out, his position as a as a resident of Mississippi in a family that was long established, in a community that knew him well, um, earned him pretty much contempt from all quarters. So his family thought he was basically a communist. His, you know, his. Um, his black audiences thought that, you know, he was hopelessly retrograde. And James Baldwin has perhaps the most stunning condemnation of, of Falcon on these grounds. So, mm. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. John Matthews, professor of English at Boston University and author of the book Hidden in Plain Sight, Slave Capitalism in Poll, Hawthorne, and Joel Chandler Harris. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk with you. I must confess that uh, that dream that I had that day has at many points turned into a nightmare. Now, I'm not one to lose hope. I keep on hoping. Uh, I still have faith in the future. But I've had to analyze many things over the last few years, and I would say over the last few months. I've gone through a lot of soul searching and agonizing moments. And I've come to see that uh, we have uh, many more difficult days ahead and some of the old optimism was a little superficial and now it must be tempered with a solid realism. And I think the realistic fact is that we still have a long, long way to go.
Freedom now. Freedom now. Freedom now. Freedom now. Freedom now. At KPFK. So I think the biggest problem now is that we got our gains over the last 12 years at bargain rates, so to speak. It uh, didn't cost the nation anything. In fact, it helped the economic side of the nation to integrate lunch counters and public accommodations. It didn't cost the nation anything uh, to get uh, the right to vote established. And now we are confronting issues that cannot be solved without costing the nation billions of dollars. Now, I think this is where we are getting our greatest resistance. They may put it on many other things, but we can't get rid of slums and poverty without it costing the nation something. Go out and tell your neighbors not to buy Coca-Cola in Memphis. Go by and tell them not to buy sealed test milk. Tell them not to buy what is all the bread, wonder bread. Now these are some practical things that we can do. We begin the process of building a great economic base. And at the same time, we are putting pressure where it really hurts. In closing, we'd like to thank our guests, starting with Professor Tess Chuckalacall from Bowdoin College in Maine. Get into that Black-owned bookstore you know and love today and grab her book, Jim Crow Literature and the Legacy of Sudden E. Griggs. Thank you to John Matthews, professor of English at Boston University. And while you're in that bookstore, why not grab his book, Hidden in Plain Sight, Slave Capitalism in Poe, Hawthorne, and Joel Chandler Harris. Shout out to Dr. Gerald Horn for doing what he does best and guiding this train of mental liberation towards Pan-African enlightenment for yet another Saturday. Get back onto SO1 Bookstore's website today and expand your library by finding one of Dr. Horn's many informative texts to enrich your library and your mind. Word to producer Sister Tej. Much love to our spiritual backbone, Baba Didan Kamati, as well as our dear sister Luyanda Kaboka for giving us the African drumbeat historical calendar for the week. Shout out to our marvelous engineer. And last but certainly not least, Thanks to all of our loyal listeners and supporters. It takes a village to build a revolution and Freedom Now is a village to be reckoned with. Please continue to support our program. We are volunteer producers and the station needs help to pay the bills to keep the lights on and the mics hot in the building. So please dial 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735 or go online to kpfk.org to donate and support the show. This has been Brother Brandon Sankara, and you can join us on Facebook at Freedom Now Gerald Horn. You can email the program at freedomnow at kpfk.org or go on to the audio archives at kpfk.org and scroll down to Freedom Now, and you'll be able to hear this program as well as 60 days worth of prior programming here at KPFK 90.7 FM. We now send you off to our sister Assumpta with Spotlight Africa coming up next, addressing issues facing Mama Africa. And until next Saturday here at Freedom Now, we stand running our marathon, ready for revolution.